It's now my pleasure to invite Dr. David Magnus, Professor of Medicine and of Biomedical Ethics at the Stanford School of Medicine, to moderate our first talk of the day, a fireside chat on vaccine equity with Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, Senior Advisor to the White House COVID-19 Response Team. Thank you, Dean Miner. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Marcella Nunez-Smith, Senior Advisor to the White House COVID-19 Response Team. Dr. Dennis Smith is a renowned researcher, leader, and health equity advocate for structurally marginalized communities. Her work has advanced the nation's understanding of social determinants of health and how they contribute to and exacerbate the significant disparities we see today. In addition to her role at the White House, she's also Associate Dean for Health Equity Research and Professor of Internal Medicine, Epidemiology, and Public Health at the Yale School of Medicine. Dr. Nunez Smith, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, can you describe the work that you do to advise the White House COVID-19 response team? And what are the goals you hope to achieve and how much progress has been made? Mm, yes. Well, let me tell you, it's just great to have a moment to pause now in conversation with you and say, yes, <laughs> where are we with all of this work? It has been quite a portfolio of activity. I mean, you know, it's it's been a full team sprint. Um since the president uh, was inaugurated really you know, before, kind of thinking in the transition about what needs to happen, laying the groundwork you know, with a national strategy to combat uh, COVID-19 with seven top line goals and really executing on that national strategy was the charge of the White House COVID-19 response team, of course, in coordination and partnership um, with all the other agencies, all the other units and departments working across every level of government and every sector of society to, to make this happen. So it's um, it, it's been nothing short of uh, a deep honor and privilege to be in this work with everybody else on the response team and again across the, the whole of government. And so the work has always been about making sure that everyone has access to the life-saving, life-preserving resources for COVID-19, right? PPE, testing, therapies, and especially as new technologies emerge in the testing and therapy space. And of course, vaccine and vaccination, making sure that we get an entire country vaccinated. So there, I think we, we, we have had little time to pause and acknowledge the progress we've, we've made, but I think, um, I think there has been substantial progress and absolutely more work to do. Thank you. Um, you've made major contributions to the study of health disparities caused by uh, social determinants of health, as well as the different forms of discrimination faced by patients in healthcare. How do you see each of these two playing a role in vaccination and other public health measures among Black, Latin, uh, and other people of color? Yeah. So from the very beginning, right, President Biden, Vice President Harris, when they were, you know, uh, candidates, and then when they were. Um, uh, in transition, very clear that charge that in everything we did, equity would be at the center. Um, and you know, as someone who has for the last several decades uh, focused, you know, an entire career on thinking about health and healthcare equity and how we advance on those, and quite frankly, someone who's benefited and continues to from just the incredible stellar bench of scholars and others who have come before in this space, you know, who for so long have had their work diminished and dismissed, um, to, to see at the highest levels of our government, the anchoring um, on not just a principle, but, but a call to action around equity, um, I think is really notable and pretty historic. And, and I think that's the right context for kind of considering the question, because I do think we're at this moment of transformation. So even as we talk about root cause for why we knew to anticipate these very inequities you just described and why we have to be so intentional to disrupt them and address them is that I am hopeful ever so and optimistic that as we move forward and the next pandemic, that we will have done the necessary redress so that we aren't having a conversation about um, the same predictable pattern, right? People of color, uh, those communities that have been marginalized and minoritized, and medically underserved, you know, discussing the disproportionate impact uh, on those groups again. And so, you know, certainly in the space of, of vaccine and vaccination and holding, holding that up, um, and why we knew from the beginning that it was going to be a lift to get 
vaccination into every every corner, every community, every block, every neighborhood in our country, because not just of the legacy, but quite frankly, because of the contemporary manifestations of racism, of discrimination, of bias in the healthcare system, and frankly, in every single sector of our society. And so we have to begin with acknowledging we have not proven ourselves trustworthy at every step of the way. The president made those remarks. Number one in the national strategy is rebuilding trust, right? Um, and so at the center, so, th you know, that's part of it. And then of course, and I'm sure we'll get into more of this too, but, you know, definitely the very real structural barriers that people face in connecting with vaccination, be it transportation, lack thereof, child care, pay time off, you know, people needing those kinds of, uh, of, of securities, right, and assistance in connecting with vaccination. So the administration, you know, has addressed structural barriers, um, have invested in partnerships, collaborations, value the expertise that people on the front line bring, knowing is trusted messengers, tailored messages, being respectful of, of people and their questions, um, being patient as folks become vaccine ready. I mean, all of this is just part of, um, of the necessary work uh, that has to be done and every single person, every single life is worth it. Can you maybe elaborate a little bit about how trust can be earned by the health system that does have this historical legacy of racism and, as you just pointed out, current documented evidence of contemporary racism in current medical practice? Absolutely. And, you know, this is a moment when um, we... <laughs> We have to sort of turn, you know, sort of turn the, the mirror, the lens on ourselves in this space. It, you know, it, it is that time for self-interrogation. You know, I'm a practicing internist, so I, I, I certainly own um, and I'm I, I love my profession. I, I would do this a million times again. I'm part of a large healthcare delivery system um, here in Connecticut, and I'm very proud of so many of the things that we do. You know, it's an and statement, though, for all of us in this work that we need to do more and in many cases do differently. Um, and so we have to begin with that self-interrogation as healthcare delivery systems, facing some very um, maybe harsh truths, inviting people to share right their perspective, their views, their solutions really importantly, right? How do we think differently uh, about who comes to a decision-making table for us, whether it be about things like our data, what we collect, how we collect it, who governs it, how we share it, whether it be things like how we invest our resources, what we prioritize, um, how we, uh, you know, how, how we deliver on our clinical care, how we deliver on our, our mission more broadly. Um, I think we have to push back on an instinct, maybe, that the fixes are quick, um, understand that the, the process of uh, establishing trustworthiness it, it, when we're lucky reestablishing, but in many places, let's be honest, it wasn't ever there. And so establishing that trustworthiness, the patience of that process, um, being sincere, understanding this is not performative. Um, there is not a check box, right? That we can say, do these three things, um, but it is process and it is the how and the who. And if we begin with that, right? How could we begin to do better and do differently and do more in partnership, genuinely so, with the communities that have been most affected? That's how we begin to establish trustworthiness. Like one, one more example, you know, in many communities, as we showed up with a vaccination campaign, people rightly said, vaccine, where have you been, right? We have been struggling here with lack of housing, We've been struggling with limited economic opportunity. We've been struggling with community violence, right? Poor schools for our children. And now you care a lot and wanna talk about vaccines and vaccinations. So you show up and you acknowledge the lived reality for people and say, yeah, it's COVID-19, it's a pandemic. We have the tools. We wanna make sure everybody can benefit from this scientific discovery. And also we're gonna have those listening moments and those action follow-ups around the issues in your community. And the White House set out and did that um, with many cities across the country. I'm fortunate to be in conversation with many stakeholders uh, to, to understand really these issues. And it can't be one 
one note, right? So the one note can't be vaccination. If you're a healthcare system, the one note can't be what happens in your hospital beds. It's how you show up as a member of that community. So let's give an, a concrete example of this. So early in the pandemic, we actually had very little data about how COVID-19 was impacting minority communities and, and, uh, and communities of color. Uh, we were essentially flying blind, allowing disparities to go on undetected. Has the situation approved and are there any lessons we can draw from that experience to inform the vaccine rollout and how we respond to future health threats? Yeah, you, you know, I could talk to you forever about data. I really could because it, it's it's not it's not the most glamorous of topics, but it is fundamental, right? It's the foundation. Any conversation we're going to have about advancing equity, like how do we know, right? How do we know where we are? How do we know how we're doing? Where we're going? How do we set up course for ourselves? So we need the data there to drive our equitable decision making. There, there's no question, and 100 right. I mean our Data infrastructure failed us. I mean, both in many ways and on some technical levels, but I think also in revealing how data reflected our values uh, and, and we didn't get passing grades, right? We had not invested in data systems that spoke to, that spoke to the lived realities of so many people. Um, you know, we or had been talking about race and ethnicity, but the intersections with so many other identities, people with disabilities, um, you know, uh, people who are gender and sexually diverse, right? Thinking about people in rural communities, all else. And for so many groups, invisible in our data. So we have one conversation about insufficient data, like the race ethnicity variable, and then just completely absent data, um, like people with disabilities. None of that is acceptable, cannot be the way forward, cannot be the way now, uh, even in the pandemic. I mean, I, I, I think it is it's great. We have seen an Im improvement in the quality of our pandemic data in terms of who's getting affected and where we need to target resources. Um, we are not at perfection, uh, even though we have seen increases in data collection and reporting. I think one of the things that 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 is notable now in tying some of our conversation together, you know, race, ethnicity, and vaccination uptake, is we're at a point now where you know the data are just triangulating that we're seeing nationally. Um, several polls, KFF, Pew, um, the CDC's uh, own polling, and others showing that those racial ethnic gaps in vaccination uptake for eligible adults narrowed, eliminated, in some cases reversed. Um, and I think that's very encouraging. Uh, we're trying to get to 100%, though. So all of all of these um, all of these findings still say we have to continue the work that we've been doing uh, to get everybody vaccinated. And we need those data. As those data have improved, the resources have been directed where they were most needed with result. So absolutely, investment uh, in equitable data systems is a top priority. So you, you've already mentioned several different possible avenues of attack to help address problems like uh, ensuring that that um, these communities are vaccinated. What would you say are the top one to two challenges that really need to be tackled head on right now to really Im improve vaccination rates among these populations? Yeah, well, you know, I think kind of where we are at this moment is trying to get the entire country to that 100%. You know, I, I find it very encouraging that we're seeing so many data sources align. And when we look at eligibility, um, particularly for our adults, and we look at questions of race, ethnicity, and where we do have those variables, that we are seeing that narrowing. I mean, most certainly, um, you know, we still have gaps by rurality. I think that's incredibly important um, and continue to make sure that, you know, everyone in rural America is able to access both the vaccinations themselves in easy, convenient ways, but also access the information around the vaccines their effectiveness, their strong safety profiles um, from you know, sources and individuals that they trust in ways that they trust. And so there's always work to be done um, on, that, on that front. And then you know, at, at this point, it's one-on-one -on -one to get us closer to that 100% across the country, one-on-one -on -one conversations, meeting people where they are, showing up with a spirit of respect 
and curiosity, right? I mean, we shouldn't presume why someone might not yet be vaccine ready. Um, and so sh showing up and knowing that you might have to show up again and again, uh, and maybe a third and fourth time before somebody gets vaccinated. But, but certainly as a country, um, you know, we, I'm a parent, I know we're all looking to, to make sure our children are safe and protected. There's a role for us to play as adults, vaccinating ourselves so they are cocooned and protected in that way. Um, but also hopefully children themselves, especially those younger ones, currently 12 and older are eligible, but, but younger children being eligible as well for vaccination. So absolutely um, uh, more to do. We're trying to make sure that women who are expecting and who are planning to become pregnant uh, know the real urgency, the need to get vaccinated. Um, so, you know, continuing to think about uh, groups in that way that, that maybe have not yet um, realized full potential and protection from vaccination. Um, it's interesting that you've mentioned that some parts of the country are doing a much, much better job in terms of equity and, um, and vaccination than other areas. Are there um, approaches in some areas of the country or some states that have uh, been developed that you think have been particularly um, uh, uh, key to their successes? This has been a time you know, of just tremendous innovation. And I think that that can be said on many, many, many fronts and certainly in this vaccination space as well. Um, you know, one of the, the, the roles that the administration played was to lift up these very, you know, very same best and promising practices as people innovated to help people get connected with vaccination. Um, even within the White House, uh, we stood up a, a partnership with black owned beauty shops and barber salons, right? Like just to say, hey, someplace where people go for trusted information, trusted venues. And I think, you know, the theme across really every one of these bright lights um, of innovation was partnership, right? Was partnership with the communities that have been most affected, was showing up with that spirit of humility and saying, you know, we don't know the answer you know the solutions, the situational wisdom and expertise that lives here. Um, help us think about how we can connect with people um, in a way that is respectful, but is also culturally and linguistically responsive um, and aligned. And so just myriad examples of ingenuity across the country. Uh, and quite frankly, you know, when, when I talk about numbers now and, and the narrowing of the gaps and the elimination of the racial disparity in vaccination uptake, that is the result of what has been a whole of society lift. And I know I personally have a lot of gratitude to each and every single person who got out there and made those numbers what they are today. So, you know, what we have to do now, I think, is be sure we're cataloging all of these, you know, what have emerged as best and promising practices. Um, so that we have that roadmap, because, you know, unfortunately, there will be a next time, um, but that we have that roadmap that we can follow from day one. So I'm going to turn to a, a different direction as we're sort of getting close to the end of our time together. According to a recent study, the percentage of physicians in the U.S. are Black has increased only 4% in the past 120 years. Um, in 1900, 1.3% of physicians were Black. By 1918, 2018, that number had managed to grow to just 5.4%. Uh, back in 2007, you published landmark research about race and discrimination in the healthcare workplace. Do you think things have improved since then? And what needs to change? Do you think improving representation from people of color in medicine could impact issues like patient trust? Mm, yeah, I think this is just a critical issue, right? One of our workforce. And I do, think yes, yes. I do think representation absolutely matters. It, it's always, to me, every time I hear the, the numbers, I pause, right? Because there is so much that could be impacted and kind of why we are there, why we have plateaued um, in terms of representation in the workforce. So I say, look, it's necessary and insufficient, right? Like we need to absolutely invest and commit to having not just physicians, right? I mean, you could, you could switch out and say across the health professions, really, that we see a dearth, um, you know, what um, former Secretary Sullivan's missing persons, right? Like where, where are, where are, where are we? Um, and so it's important to have that representation. 
uh, but it doesn't substitute, right, for the, the changes we also need to make in terms of policies and practices. Structural diversity is a must. Um, it's an imperative. We can no longer allow ourselves, I think, to have pat answers like, you know, the pipeline is leaky or we can't find anyone or, you know, we have to make a concerted commitment that there, there is no lack of talent in any of these communities, right? And so we have to absolutely nurture and grow and welcome. But we have to think a lot about, you know, when we talk about inequities, representation in the workforce isn't going to reverse that because we're seeing the legacy and the consequence of what were intentional and generational policies and practices and, and, and processes, right? So we need to do that work as well um, in terms of of addressing, redressing, reversing those. So I say, yes, you know, let us be committed uh, as a collective to advancing representation in our workforce, in our leadership, um, at all the different tables. Um, that is the entry level of work we need to do, but we cannot stop there. Do you think that the discrimination that you uh, identified back in 2007 has gotten better or, or, or is it still just as bad as it was back then? For, for people in the healthcare, discrimination in the healthcare setting for, for workers? Yeah, I mean, so th this, is, this is one of our hard truths. Uh, you know, the reality, I'm a practicing internal medicine physician. The reality is I still walk into rooms um, and, uh, you know, with stethoscope around neck, um, ID badge in plain view, and the patients will offer me, you know, their tray for clearance, um, or I will, talk to them about their health and they'll say, I'd rather wait until a doctor gets here, even after introducing myself as the head doctor on the team. I've had to have my own house staff redirect patients and say, I am in fact the attending physician. So I don't, you know, I don't think that this, that, that it is uh, uncommon for healthcare professionals um, from groups that are underrepresented to, to, to still face some of those experiences. Uh, but at the end of the day, the reality is I'm still in a position of privilege and power that many of my patients are not in. Um, and so we do need to make sure that as a profession, uh, we are, you know, we, we promote belonging um, for everybody that we're inviting into this work with us. Uh, but there is so many parallel tracks of activity because to think of how I can be marginalized, you know, as an attending physician in, in an outstanding hospital and health system, um, what is this experience like for our patients who are coming through the door? And so it's through, it's that lens that I use to say, oh my goodness, uh, we are on the hook to do so much more to be accountable um, to these very patients, to the communities where we are. Uh, to provide not just high quality health care, but good health, well-being, um, a, a safety, right, and a sense of welcoming and belonging for everybody who comes through our doors. Well said. Thank you so much for your time with us today. And thank you so much for all the incredibly important work that you do. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Be well, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, Marcella and David, for that nuanced and thorough discussion. It was eye-opening to hear about all of the research and outreach that goes into uh, public health and education for various communities. And wonderful that there are experts like Marcella who are helping the federal government address problems on the national level.